Man, it is good to see you guys this morning. I am super excited that we're starting a new series today called Love Intentionally, because love doesn't happen accidentally. And we're gonna be talking about that for the next several weeks. I have really no idea how long we're gonna go. It's gonna be as long as you guys stay interested. And uh, we got a little bit of time because we have a few weeks before summer, and I'm just super excited about it. But I was just talking to, to Joy this last week. We were driving and, you know, I've been uh, just describing to her how I like to try to take the scripture that I'm teaching and view our lives through the scripture. And that's one of the ways I get these stories to tell you on Sunday morning that seems kind of random, but yet to me, they make sense. And uh, so I said, why don't you look um, you know, through the eyes of scripture this week and see if you can come up with any stories, Joy. And so we were driving on the freeway and uh, now Joy has a trigger on the freeway. She has a lot of triggers, but on the freeway, she has one. And uh, well, at least the one that I'm talking about. She hates ladders. We've had some bad experience with ladders in our, in our lives. One time we were driving to Lake Tahoe and I was in a big Ford excursion with a brush guard on the front, thankfully. And it was years ago and a ladder came flying off the top of a truck, uh, a big 12 foot extension ladder, tumbling down the road, hit us, you know, right in the hood. And we flattened the ladder and drove over the top of it. No damage to the car. You know, a little piece of the, the rubber on the brush guard popped off, but Joy was kind of freaked out. A few years later, same thing happened. Car in the left lane, we're in the right lane, three lanes of freeway. Ladder comes flying off, tumbles across two lanes, of course. And uh, I have to swerve out of the way with my cat-like reflexes, which was no problem. But Joy thought that the ladder was trying to kill us. And so on Friday, we're driving and there's a sketchy minivan with no license plates. And it's got one huge ladder on top of it on the rack. And it only has one ratchet strap. Now, if you know my wife, you know one ratchet strap is one of her big pet peeves. She's like two ratchet strap kind of person, maybe more. And they only had one. And they were driving about 75 down the freeway. And the ladder was pulling sideways in the one ratchet strap. And it was like one of those from Dollar General, not one that you buy, you know, like a three inch ratchet strap. It was like one that you have to pull. And so Joy was like, we're getting away from them because that's a ladder and it's dangerous. And I said, no, I want you to feel the tingle. I pulled him behind them. And I'm like, I can dodge the ladder. And, and Joy said, we need to tell the church this story. And I said, what in the world? How does this, you know, what sermon would you preach? And she said, oh, it'd be simple. I would stand up and tell them the story. And then I would say, don't do stupid stuff. That would be my sermon. And then she'd say, I'd say, go to lunch. Now, and uh, I told Joy that you, they, you guys might have a new pastor because you'd love that so much. One quick story, you know, go to lunch. And she said, and the best part is they wouldn't know if I was calling you stupid or the guy you know, in the, in the minivan with the ladder. And so I decided it didn't really go with my message, but I did tell you the story because Joy wanted me to. But I want you guys to view your lives through the lens of scripture. You'll find that there's relevance everywhere. So take the Bible, look through the Bible at your lives, and you'll find all sorts of examples that connect. Today, we're gonna be talking about love. And my biggest fear today is that you think you know it, you think you got it, you think you've heard it. You're like, oh, Pastor Rick, I've been to a wedding. I know 1 Corinthians 13. Every pastor reads 1 Corinthians 13 at a wedding. I've got a friend who has it on a plaque on their wall in their living room. Um, oh yeah, that's the love chapter. Oh yeah, yeah, I know that. Let me promise you, friends, you don't know that, okay? You may be familiar with that, but you don't do that. And we're gonna work on that because we need to work on it. You'll see in just a minute, there are 15 different descriptions of love. And it is so important. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses one through three, the apostle Paul sums it up by saying, you're not any good without love. If you don't have love, you're no good to anyone. You're no good to God. Now, God loves us anyway. No good to the people around you. You're no good. You got to have love. There's three types of love mentioned in the New Testament. Three words. The first one is phileo. And that's a friendly kind of love. It's the kind of love that you may have with a buddy, with a friend. It's not, there's nothing wrong with it. It's uh, the love of camaraderie, the love of hanging out. I really enjoy you. So we hang out together. It's phileo love. There is Eros, erotic love, which is usually a sexual kind of love and should only be expressed between a husband and a wife in a committed marriage relationship. Now, Eros can apply to desiring other things and passions and things, but in general, it's a, it's a physical romantic kind of love. Those are not the kinds of love that we're talking about. We're talking about the kind of love 
that is summed up in the idea or concept of agape love. When the Bible says God is love, <clears throat> that's the closest thing that we have to a definition of love. The Bible never really de defines love. It just describes it. And I want to read to you 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in, chapter, in verse 4. And this will be the passage where we're spending most of our time over the next several weeks as we unpack it and you find how amazingly challenging but beautiful that this really is. Love is patient. That's where we're going to be today, by the way. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. Wait till we get to that week. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, and love never fails. Now, in English, they're adjectives. In Greek, they're verbs. Love is never meant to be understood in any way except as an action. How loving are you? Agape love is not the love of convenience. It's not the temporary kind of love where as long as something's added to my life, value, I stick around. It's not the kind of love that's just practical that the moment becomes impractical or difficult, I bail. It's the kind of love that's committed to the person we love, to the God we love, that brings with it a permanence, that brings with it a desire for the best for that person. It's a love that talks about no matter what, for as long as it takes, no matter what it takes, because I am not as important in my preferences and personal desires as loving like Jesus. And it's really, really hard. How loving are you? It's easy to love when people are lovable. It's easy to love God when God's doing what we want him to do. But we live in a temporary world where commitment is transactional, where we come and go, we're impatient, demanding immediate gratification. And the moment we don't get it, we move on to something or someone else. And this is a love that is counter-cultural. And it's a love that by and large, the Holy Spirit has to create in you because it's not normal. It's not human. Um, remember the first week we started off together in January when we talked about New Year's resolutions? You're like, man, when are you going to stop talking about that, right? Um, I haven't given up on you. Have you given up on yourself, right? You're still going. It's April. If you've fallen off the wagon in whatever goal you set for yourself, there's still time, right? Whether you want to lose a few, whether you want to study something, read something, whether you want, I mean, whatever it is, uh, you, there's still time. And I'm going to continue to encourage you and nudge you and coach you because it's really important to have discipline and to set goals. And spiritually, it's no different. And so we talked about being transformed and we talked about Romans 12, one and two, and this was a long time ago. And we talked about how there's a current of the world that we're born into and we're comfortable in. And it pulls us away from what God wants. And then there's a current of the Holy Spirit that we're not born into, that we have to decide to become a believer, a follower of Christ. And then we have to put ourselves in this place, in this current. And when we do, then God can begin to do something in us that's supernatural. He can create something in us. He can grow something in us, but we can't do it ourselves. All we can do is put ourselves over there. That's the 20% that we do. The 80%, and it's really 100% God, but for our purposes, 80-20, the 80% is what God does. One of the things that you've done to put yourself in that current is by being here this morning. You have made a commitment for at least an hour of your week to be a, a still target for God. You've carved out some time, some space for him to work. And here you are, you're seated and you're waiting. So you put out some effort. If you've joined us online, a little effort, a little intentionality. God does the rest. But we have to put ourselves in that place. So I had a whole series about putting ourselves in that place. Remember that series that we began our year together doing? 
The very, very first week was the transformation week. I motivated you to set goals, to, to do things that are uncomfortable that maybe you don't wanna do, to get something you couldn't get otherwise. The next week I talked to you about, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it, that my attitude will be good. I will be positive and optimistic. I will not focus on the negative. I will not be bitter. I will choose to be joyful because that's the foundation. Then we move to prayer. And we talked about the second time that Jesus instructed his disciples to pray. And I gave you a little template how you could break your prayers down and some homework. Some of you did it. Some of you probably didn't. That's okay. The week after that, we talked about reading scripture and reading scripture is so mysterious and hard for, for many people. So I just broke down 2 Timothy 3.16, gave you four little sections, questions to ask. And I even gave you scriptures to read during the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, so that you could go and study the word. Then we talked about intentionally influencing the world or the people around us and how to reach out. And by the way, that's what our Wednesday evening Bible study is about. We begin last week. It'll be in two days from now in this room on this Wednesday, and the final one will be a week from Wednesday. And then after that, we talked about how to evaluate our past. And we had a trash can over here, remember that? And I had a wheelbarrow over here, remember that? And I talked to you about the four Fs, facts, feelings, findings, and future and how to decide what goes in the trash can and what goes in the wheelbarrow that we take forward with us as we move on into life. Trying to prepare you and help you to grow, to provide some spiritual disciplines for you to put into your life and, and to, to see Jesus do something amazing in you. And then we had an Easter break, which is what you do, right? Because we celebrate Easter and now we're back. And I'm gonna be giving you, at the end of our time together today, another assignment, some homework. If I was your boss, I'd make you. If I was your professor, I would assign it to you, but I'm just your pastor. I'm your friend and I love you. So I'm gonna ask you to do it, but that's not now, it's later. Right now, we're gonna talk about love. I wanna invite a friend to come up on stage, um, Tom Pogansy. Tom, would you please come up on stage? And I'm gonna need a microphone for Tom. Thank you very much, it's Pastor Dan. It's on and ready to go. See that line right there? You gotta stand inside the line. That's the, that's the rule. Yeah, we, got, we have rules around here, Tom. It's for the people at home watching. So they don't wanna see half a Tom or no Tom. That was, yeah. So um, I've asked Tom to come up here for a couple reasons. One is Tom is our city serve captain for our Ankeny Police Department. And you've been doing this be since before COVID, right? Uh, yeah, just about five years. Uh, about five years. And your team serves uh, the Ankeny Police Department uh, most of the time on a monthly basis, doing things like what? Yep, so on a monthly basis, we'll do drop-offs of uh, snacks and drinks that they can take in pr patrol cars with them. Uh, a couple times a year, we'll do a cookout. Mm -hmm. And then any volunteer work we can do for events that they have going on that yeah. we can help out with. And um, recently, Tom set a goal. And that's only one of the reasons that he's up here. But I love people who set goals and, and work to achieve those goals. And if you fail, it's okay, because we're trying, but if you succeed, even better. And um, you just recently set a goal uh, for yourself that you saw an opportunity. What was that? Uh, so the police department offers a Citizens Police Academy. Uh, it's a 10-week course for three hours on Tuesday nights where they'll teach you all about what the police officers, the training they go through, the things they experience, uh, just all the different departments just get a better idea of kind of what they go through and what they deal with. Now, you're not a police officer by trade. What's your day job? Uh, I'm an industrial engineer. Uh, industrial engineer. So that's not really close to law enforcement. Nope. You ever arrested anybody at work? Nope. Found any drugs in a seizure or search? Nope, try nope. to stay away from that. Okay, good. So you're doing this, why? I mean, it's taken you 30 hours, right? Yep, 30 hours. Uh, just get a better understanding of what they go through, uh, see if there's more opportunities that we can do to serve them and just better serve them. So 10 weeks, three hours a week, which has caused you to do some things and probably not do some things that have been sacrificial, right? What, what is it, how has it affected your life? Yep, so it's on uh, Tuesday nights. So basically I'll get up in the morning, might see my kids in the morning, might not, but then uh, because we live in Story City, class is down in Ankeny, uh, it's from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., so they're all in bed by the time I get home. So for the last, it's coming up on just about over now, but for the last nine weeks, I haven't been able to see them on Tuesdays pretty much at all. Yeah, so it's caused you a little sacrifice, and then your wife, Danielle, probably a little sacrifice. Being, yep, definitely. Yeah, just being a single parent for one night a week, it's tough when you're not used to it. With three kids. Yep. Yeah. All right, so um, you graduate a week from Wednesday, right? 
Yeah, a week from Wednesday. And so you'll have accomplished your goal. And I think it's really great that, that uh, you know, Tom has done that. And it just kind of illustrates our commitment to City Serve, where we serve law enforcement, uh, the Des Moines Police, the Sheriff's Department, State Patrol, Ankeny Police, Waukee, uh, the Des Moines Public Schools, Sadell Schools, and as you saw in our announcements, um, Camp Dodge, uh, Army National Guard. It's our commitment to do that, fire and EMS. And um, Tom is, is demonstrating that. But he set a goal in his life. And he chose to sacrifice for that goal, to do some things that maybe he didn't want to do. Did you want to go to class every Tuesday or was it ever? No, there's quite a few times where I was tired at the end of the work day or I wanted to go home and see my kids or they just started soccer. So I was going to miss out on some of that. And so, but you did it anyway because you wanted to, to graduate, right? Yep. Yeah. And so a lot of times when we talk about life, it's intuitive for us to set a goal and we know we have to sacrifice. We know we have to, to do things we may not want to do. We know we have to not do some things that maybe we would prefer to do. And, and it, it just makes sense. But spiritually, sometimes when I talk about setting a goal, you may go, yeah, I want to be more like Jesus, but it should be easy. It should just come naturally. What relationship have you had in your life that just is easy and comes naturally? Is anybody married? Um, every relationship takes a little bit of work, but yet it's like, ah, oh, here I am, God, transform me if you want to. It should be easy. You do all the work. And it's like the only thing in life we treat that irresponsibly. And so today I'm gonna to be challenging you again to set a goal. The goal that I'm gonna be challenging you today to set is that you put yourself in a place that you cooperate with God as we work through a series that's designed to help us become more loving and today specifically more patient. And so love is like a beam of light. Now, the third reason Tom's up here is because now that he's a trained law enforcement officer, he is qualified to handle tactical light. And so uh, love is like a beam of light. Now, this is a prism. It's not a crystal ball. Um, you know, somebody was joking earlier that maybe I could see the score of the Iowa women's basketball game. This came from Amazon and it's not really a very good prism, but I mean, what I wanna do is show you how love is like a beam of light. And we're gonna turn the lights off for a second and it's okay, we will be right back on, but I just wanna show you, you can look up and you can see what uh, it does, what love does when going through a prism. Let's do that. So love is a beam of light going through a prism that divides love into 15 different characteristics. And all 15 characteristics or different characteristics make up love. Love gives meaning to life. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. Love is not rude. Love is not easily angered. Love rejoices with the truth. Love protects, love trusts, love hopes. Love always preserves. Love never fails, love keeps no record of wrongs. So in a minute, we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about the first one. Love is patient. And I wanna ask you to get your pump primed, to get you ready. Are you known as a patient person? If you said, oh yeah, Pastor Rick, I'm a patient person. If I asked the person sitting next to you, would they amen that or would they call you out? We're gonna talk about it. We're gonna have some fun. So I went to the courthouse last week, um, didn't get married and um, didn't have court. I just needed to go do car tag, get them renewed. And <clears throat> yeah, you can do it by mail. I didn't. So you have to actually go in and you know do it. So I parked in the parking lot. It's hard to find parking downtown. And I parked behind a $100,000 pickup truck and guy got out and looked like a farmer to me. Um, $100,000 pickup truck, uh, overalls that looked like he'd been working. Um, so lots of money, working guy, overalls, figured he probably owned every cornfield from here to Ankeny uh, or Ankeny to Ames and um, you know, whatever. That was my, my judgment. It was not a bad judgment. It was just an assumption. And so I'm following him into the courthouse and he's walking kind of slow um, or slowly. And um, I was trying to decide if you pass him, you know, or, or if you just kind of, because we were probably going the same place and I didn't know exactly what to do. So I didn't pass him. And when you get up to the doors to go inside, you know, you got two sheriff's deputies that sit inside at a little desk and they just sort of look at everybody and decide if you got something. There's no real, you know, metal detector. They just kind of, you know, just look at you and go, okay, you can go. Well, the guy goes up to the first door and the door is like one of those doors that you sort of step on. And when you step on it, it's got the pressure plate and it opens like a grocery store anywhere else. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I mean, we'd see every day we go to these doors. 
And all you have to do is just go up and you step. And as soon as you step, the door opens. Well, the ones at the courthouse are a little slow. I figure it's time for them to draw their weapons if they decide that you're not appropriate to come into the courthouse. They're a little slow. And the guy that I'm going behind, he goes up and he steps on the, on the, the little pressure mat. And before the door's open, he goes like this, like that. And the door's open. And then there's another little door that they have to go, you have to go through the same exact door. And so he takes two steps up and he's standing on the little pressure mat. And before it opens, he goes like this and the door's open. And so I thought maybe you had to do that too, because it was a special courthouse door. I didn't really think that. But what I did think is the guy went through some doors one time that didn't open and he got frustrated and he stamped a couple times and that didn't work. So he opened his, and all of a sudden it opens. And so now that's the way you open doors, right? It's just human nature. It's what we do. And what I want to do is I don't want you, if you formed a conclusion in your past about the way this works, this whole love thing, this whole patience thing, if you formed a conclusion and you've been doing it a certain way, don't just assume that that's the only way and that it even works. It's just the way you decided to do it at the time when you stopped, well, when you formed your conclusion. The first characteristic or description of love is that love loves patiently, or love is patient. Now, there's two words in the New Testament used for patience. Now, I got to come over here and we got to talk for a second, because I'm going to talk to you about some Greek. And um, it's kind of, I mean, I don't do it very often. I study and use the original language every week. I don't share it with you. Sometimes pastors do it because they want to sound like they're really smart and they try to impress you with a lot of Greek words. And it's not always relevant. Uh, and, but today it's super relevant. I just have to talk to you. And there's four words I'm going to talk to you about. So you're going to have to put your thinking caps on because um, it's going to take a little bit more thinking than normal. But you have to understand there's two words in the New Testament for patience. There's macrothumia and hupomone. Now they're translated into English oftentimes as the same word, which is super confusing. They're translated into English as patience, as forbearance, as gentleness or long suffering sometimes. And you never know which one it is unless you look. And how are you supposed to look unless you've studied and know the tools to use to be able to figure it out? And so my job is to have gone to school, which I did, and figured out how to use the tools, which I did, so that I can read Greek scholars like my dad and others who tell us these things so that I can share them with you. And it's really important because these two different types of patients have totally different meanings. The first one, macrothemia, is patience with people, specifically with people. And here's what it means. The ability to avenge yourself the ability to stand up for yourself, the ability to talk back, the ability to give a dirty look, the ability to smart off, the ability to be chippy. But the conscious choice or desire not to. In a macro sort of way, it's the turn the other cheek principle, which has nothing to do with self-defense, by the way. It has to do with insult. But in this particular context, 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul's talking to a church that's... um, Well, they're living in close proximity with each other. So we look at the people closest to us. And for 12 chapters, the apostle Paul to the church in Corinth kept saying, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Quit doing that. Stop doing that. You're better than that. Live a different way. And then all of a sudden in verse or in chapter 13, he shines the light like Tom did into a prism of love and 15 different descriptions pop off. First one being love patiently, specifically patience with people. The second Greek word, hupomone, is patience with circumstance or under circumstances. Important, love even talks about that later in our study. But today, I want you to think only about people. And I want you to think only about people who are closest to you. And I want you to think about the person who wakes up next to you, if there's someone who wakes up next to you, or the first people you see in your day, your inner circle. And I want you to think about the question, am I slow burning? Am I long suffering? Am I forbearing? Or do I right every wrong, meet every challenge with a challenge, address every infraction, set everything straight for the record and for my pride? Would my wife, my husband, my father, my mother, my grandfather, grandmother, son or daughter, my best friend, my coworker, would they say you're a patient person? You're patient with me, with people? That even though you have the ability to defend yourself, you choose not to. 
that's hard. Here's a different way to look at it. Can you just let it go? Can we just shut our mouths and let it go? I mean, what's the big deal, right? I've learned over 30 something years doing this, that a wise way to lead a church is that I worry about my character and God worries about reputation. So you worry about your character and you let God worry about your reputation. Don't meet every insult with an insult. Don't correct every infraction. Can you just let it go? Can you be patient? Why? Because Jesus was patient. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter that don't forget with a day or with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. Jesus is not slow in keeping his promise to come again like some people accuse him of being, but he's patient because he doesn't want anyone to suffer. He's slow burning, he's long suffering. What does that mean? He's patient with us and with our sin and with our failures over and over and over again. He's patient with our country. He's patient with our world. He's patient with our government. He's patient with all the ideas and principles and currents that chip away at the things that Jesus holds dear. He's patient and long-suffering because he's playing a long game and salvation for the world is at stake. And so the apostle Paul is saying, this is what Jesus has done for us. So won't you do this with each other? And we say, how? And the apostle Paul gives us more instructions in Galatians. He says, it's one of the fruit of the spirit. In Galatians 5, it's translated as a different word, but it's the same Greek word. The fruit of the spirit is love. That's the first one. Joy, peace, forbearance is the word translated for patience or macrothumia. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. You're free, but don't use your freedom to live for yourselves. Don't use your freedom to exact every wrong, to right every challenge, to, to be chippy and cause friction. Don't be so grouchy and hard to be around and to get along. And here's the reason. Who wants to hear about Jesus from somebody who's just a flat out jerk and difficult to be around? How many people do you know that are like that? You don't wanna be around them, but they're quick to tell you about Jesus. And my response is, if that's the kind of Jesus you got, I don't want it. Because I don't wanna be like that. And I don't think you do either. So how do I become patient? In Galatians chapter five, the apostle Paul continues and gives us two themes. Now here are two more Greek words I'm gonna give you. And this it, just two more, I promise, just two. And we'll be done with the Greek words. But the very first thing he says is, if you want the fruit of the spirit, and the fruit of the spirit is a product of the Holy Spirit in your life. And it's what happens when we put ourselves in the current of the spirit. When we put ourselves and make space in our life for God to do something in us. Like I talked about during the first series that we we're in together this year with the whole prayer thing, the Bible study thing, the Thanksgiving thing, the looking at your past thing. All those weeks were designed for you to put space in your life to put yourself right here in the current of the Holy Spirit so that God can do something in you. So you're doing something to allow yourself that time. And so the apostle Paul says, so I say to you, walk by the Spirit. Now the word here for walk is peripateo. And the reason it's important is because a little later, he says, I want you to march in step with or stay in step with the Spirit. But when the Apostle Paul says that he wants you to, to walk in the Spirit, what he means is he wants us to live in the realm of the Spirit. And that sounds very Star Wars-y or science fiction. I'm gonna live in the realm of the Spirit. That actually sounds like it's really no earthly good, right? What are you doing today? I'm gonna live in the realm of the Spirit. Um, but think about it. You're setting goals for yourself. And the goals that you set for yourself, you want to accomplish. I want to grow spiritually. The goal that I'm going to ask you to set for yourself is that you want to become more patient this week. Now, the other goals you have for yourself, if you have a goal that you want to lose a few pounds, do you wake up in the morning and go, man, I hope I'm not hungry today. You have no plan, but you're like, I hope I choose the right kinds of things when I go to the wrong kinds of places. I mean, you don't do that. If you wanna work out and you wanna get in shape, you don't go to the gym and go, today I'm gonna to do whatever I want, whatever I feel like, wherever the spirit leads me, right? I mean, you just do one thing all the time or nothing. 
But yet spiritually, we do that. We think it just happens for us and we set a goal. And so you have to have a plan. And so we put things in our life every day that put us in the spirit of the current or the, the current of the spirit to make space like you're doing right now, like you do when you open the Bible, like you do when you pray. And you live in the realm of the spirit so the spirit can transform you. You give him time. In any relationship, in any long distance relationship, staying in touch requires intentionality and it requires time. Not a lot, just a little, just something intentional. And the apostle Paul says, live in the realm. It was a word that wasn't just used in scripture. It was used of the philosophers and their students where they had peripatites. And the peripatites would hang out with Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, and um, they would pay money or in a sense, the same thing as tuition and follow them around just to glean and to learn from the way that they interacted with people the way that they treated, what they said, how they bought things, how they sold things. But the point is they had to put themselves in a spot where something could happen in them. They were learning in their case to be virtuous, in our case, to be men and women of God, strong men and women with soft hearts. So you live in the realm of the spirit, which requires a little effort, intentionality, but God does it for you. Does that make sense? We can't just stand in the middle going, I hope I feel it today, because that doesn't work. You gotta put yourself in the place and then God does it for you. And so the apostle Paul, is, he's talking about this fruit of the spirit, this patience. He says, put yourself in the place in a sense on a daily basis so that the Holy Spirit can do something in you. And then he goes on and he says, if you're going to live this way and you're going to see these things, there's some days you're not gonna feel like it. And so he says, I want you to keep in step with the spirit. Now, here's the last Greek word, stoiko. It's a military term. If you are in the military and you're told to march, you march. Why? Because somebody told you to. It's a sheer act of the will. You know what to do, you do it. Well, I don't feel patient, so what? I'm going to choose patience. It's the choice of the will that has very little to do with emotion, with the other person, whether they deserve it or not. It's just deciding that I'm gonna react differently today, that I'm gonna live a little differently today. And the Apostle Paul teaches us that both of these things work together. Now, I like to view it as an 80-20. It's really God doing all the work, don't get me wrong. 20% of it is us just saying, this is what I'm doing today. And by saying, this is what I'm doing today, we move out of the current we were born into, which pulls us away from these kinds of things. And we put ourselves into the current of the Holy Spirit that God wants us in and allows God to do these things by changing us inside out. And all of a sudden you see not just the willful choice of, I gotta be patient, but I don't feel patient. To all of a sudden you are becoming Patience and the desires that you have to avenge, to mouth off, to be chippy, to cause friction, to be irritating, to be a jerk, they start to go away. And it's a miracle. And it might seem impossible, but God promises it if we cooperate. But if you don't find a way to cooperate, it ain't gonna happen. And so what I did this week was to help provide a tool for you to cooperate. Now, almost every week in the last series, I provided a tool for you to take home and homework to do. These things are important to me um, because for me, they work and they make sense. They may not work for you. And it's fine for me if you say, I don't like it, but my question would be, well, what are you gonna do instead? So the point is choose something, right? This is something I would suggest you try before you say, I don't like it, because you don't know, because I put a lot of thought and heart into it. And it's not just my thought and my heart, but it's me praying for you and asking God, what is it you want our body, our church family to experience together? And this is what we've come up with. And by the way, it's not just you, it's us, it's me. I sent this to our pastors yesterday. And Pastor Dan responded and he was like, man, I got a lot of work to do. And I said, man, me too. It's us, it's not you, it's us. But I've 
put together a Monday through Friday, I don't know what you call it, devotional thought. That sounds so churchy. It's a little push notification, a little message that you're going to get. If you have that church app downloaded and you have your notifications turned on, then each day about 7.30 in the morning, you'll hear a little ding. If you have your phone on silent, maybe it'll pop up and you'll see it. And you follow a link and it's going to bring up a little couple of paragraphs. And there's one for Monday, one for Tuesday, one for Wednesday, one for Thursday, one for Friday. I'm giving you Saturday off because you're going to be spiritually tired by Saturday. You're going to need a day to decompress because next Sunday we're going on to the next one. There's 15. Now we're not going to do all 15. Don't get, don't get scared. It's not going to be Thanksgiving and we're still working on it. And we may be working on it, but not together on, on Sunday mornings. But on Monday, this is, your, this is sort of an overview of your project. And by the way, uh, if you have the church app and you've downloaded your notes for today, you'll see the Monday through Friday at the end of your PDF. If you go on our YouTube or our Facebook, if you're watching from home, there'll be a link where you can download this. There'll be a QR code behind me in a minute that will, look at that, that will tell you if you scan that with your phone, it'll bring up the Monday through Friday. Or you can do it the way that I like to do it, which is to have um, my iPhone remind me every morning at 7.30 to do this on Monday. You're going to get a thought from me that reminds you that today somebody's going to try your patience, somebody close to you, your wife, your husband, your kids, your coworkers, somebody in your inner circle is going to flip your switch. They're going to trigger you and you're going to want to respond. Don't. Make the commitment. Today, I'm going to keep my mouth shut even if I don't feel like it. I have some scripture from Galatians 5 that will help you understand why we should do that. And then at the end, I have a prayer. Each day, they're the same little format. It's a prayer that I pray in the way I pray. It may be too casual for you. You might want to add some King James English in there, some holy this and that's in there. Do whatever you want to. It's the way I pray. And it's just something that I would suggest. God, help me today in my reactor. Help me keep my mouth shut. Help me be patient. Develop in me patience, but at least let me, you know, just not act out. That's it, Monday. Tuesday, we're going to be dealing more with internal transformation. And I'm going to remind you that today there's certainly going to be somebody who's going to trigger you, that's going to flip your switch, that's going to make you angry, that's going to make you want to lose your patience. But today, pray that God will change your reactor and your heart to where you're not nearly as irritated or combative, that your desire to avenge yourself, your desire to fight back, your desire to always be right begins to ebb a little bit. Now, it takes time, but if you do a little better, think how great that will be for you and especially the people around you. They will appreciate it, trust me. On Wednesday, we're gonna go internal because you may be finding that you have problems with doing this. It's hard. And Galatians 5 teaches us that if you're having a problem with the Holy Spirit being free in your life to transform you, that there may be thoughts, actions, or attitudes in your life. You may be doing things, thinking things, believing things that are keeping God from working in you. What are those things? And I'm going to walk you through that process of identifying them and confessing them in a prayer. On Thursday, the game gets upped a little, but remember, you only have one day left. You're going to be fine. The end is in sight. I'm going to ask you in your mind to identify the people who are the people who are most difficult for you to be patient with or around. Could be your wife, could be your husband, could be your kids, could be your coworkers. I don't know. Whoever is in your inner circle, name them to yourself. And I'm going to challenge you to pray for them. Now, don't say, God, let them not irritate me today. And I won't say anything I shouldn't say. That's not the prayer you're supposed to pray. It could be part of it, but it's not all of it. You pray that God will bless them, that whatever they're dealing with, he will help them work through, that they will experience God's love, that they'll understand his grace, that he'll draw them to himself, that they'll be blessed in every real spiritual way. And you're going to find that when you start praying for the people in your life that are the hardest for you to show, well, to love patiently, that God may not change them at all, but he's gonna to begin to change you and the way you perceive them. And then Friday, we're finally at the finish line. Friday, I'm going to say, look back over your week and tell me something you succeeded in. You're not gonna be perfect. You got five days. You got, you're gonna make some mistakes, but tell me, what, tell me a time you succeeded. When did you get it right? And there's a link there, an email link, where I'm, at, I'm just asking you to email me because I wanna know, I wanna celebrate with you you can tell me the story, change the names to protect the innocent. I just, I would love to celebrate with you. And then 
I'm gonna ask you the question. When did you get it wrong? Who did you wrong? Where did you blow it? We'll all have somebody because, well, you know, what are I, I mean, it's 10 o'clock, right? Or 1130 and I haven't done it yet today, I don't think, but I guarantee you I will by the end of the day, It'll probably be my wife and I'll have to, you know, go and I have to apologize. And that's what I'm gonna to suggest to you that when you identify the ways you've blown it, that whatever's sticking out in your mind, that you go make it right. And you don't explain yourself and you don't make excuses. You say, listen, I wounded you with my mouth, with my attitude, with my body language. I cut you off. I cut you out. I said something that was unkind. I didn't love you patiently. And I'm sorry. It's hard to ask forgiveness for somebody or from somebody close to you, but it's right. And that remorse helps us not do it again. And then finally, I'm asking you to go public again to the people around you because it's easy to go, I'm going public, I'm going to be patient. But you tell your spouse that or your kids that or your parents that or your coworkers that, they see you, they know you. There's an accountability there. And so you say something like this, listen, I've got to work on some stuff. I'm a Christian, but I'm not always great at it. And I'm supposed to love patiently. And I've committed to love you patiently. And I just want you to know. And if I blow it, I want you to tell me. However you want to say it that doesn't make it weird or make it sound like you're more spiritual than them or that you're holier than them. I mean, just say it in a natural way. And once you say it, it makes it real. And then your spiritual muscles are going to be a little sore because it's Friday and you will have done a little work, but you will have moved toward a goal. And at the end of the week, you're gonna be closer to your goal. And most importantly, through a sheer act of your will, you have put yourself in a place where God, through his Holy Spirit, will transform you into a new person. He'll do the work as long as you put in a little effort. So I'm gonna pray for you. I wanna encourage you. If you worked for me, I'd say you have to. If I was your professor, I would assign it to you and you couldn't graduate without it. But I'm just your pastor. So I'm asking you to give it a shot. And I'll pray for you today. And I'll pray for you each day this week. And next week, we're gonna move on to the second principle. We're not gonna forget the first. Father, thank you so much for the time that we've spent together. And I pray that however this message lands, there are probably some in here who've just decided what love's about, decided the limits of their patience, that they formed a conclusion just like waving their arms in front of an automatic door. Chosen to live the rest of their life, waving their arms, even though they formed the wrong conclusion. Deconstruct old ideas that have either come from a wrong understanding, from a practical solution to difficult problems, from self-preservation, and teach us truth. Show us the way to live. Show us the way to love patiently, like Jesus. I pray for my friends, and I love them, Father, but you love them far more than I could. And I know how hard they're trying, but more importantly, you know how hard they're trying. And our trying is not nearly enough, but your strength and your power through your Holy Spirit is more than we need. And so it's with that hope, that promise, that I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.